Welcome to CJRU's Funding Drive on 1280 AM. My name is Jackie Townster Harrison, and joining me in studio is Penny Clark. Hi, Penny. Hi, Jackie. So if you've been paying attention to your campus radio station here in downtown Toronto all week, of course you know it's Funding Drive Week. And of course you know that we're doing lots of special programming um, to showcase a bit of what we do on campus and also in the community. And this time slot, this time slot belongs to the youth. Uh, when we launched 1280 AM, March the 31st, this very radio station, this very year, uh, we identified that one of the priority groups that we wanted to talk a lot with was young people. And for that, we pa partnered with the Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. This office, if you haven't read about it, is responsible for kids in care and transitioning out of care, youth at risk, youth in the justice system, youth with mental health problems, youth um, in special schools, so those are schools for the deaf, schools for the blind, um, and other special schools in the province of Ontario. And I think I mentioned also youth in the justice system. Having a lot of different programs for all of these different young people um, is a lot of a balancing act. And so one of the things that I've found most interesting about our work here at 1280 is that uh, young people coming to us through the Advocates Office always have so many different ideas that we had to collect them all in a single show. So if you've been listening regularly on Thursdays, you know it's Why Are You Night? And joining us later this evening will be the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, Erwin Elman. But first, we thought it was being Funding Drive, a good time to do a best of show. So Penny's one of the new producers of the Why Are You show. Um, and we made a couple of clips of all of the good work that they've done in the spring and summer since, since launching with us. But first, I have to remind you, it is Funding Drive, and that's why we're doing a best of show. Um, please help support campus radio and student radio here in downtown Toronto. We've almost reached a modest goal of $1,280. We're just over 1000 today. I think we're at 1095 now. So you can really be today and tomorrow part of helping us reach our goal. This money goes towards new handheld recorders to replace the ones that were stolen this year. We also want to add some speakers to our lobby so all the volunteers and visitors can hear the programs as they go live. And we're also looking at buying some new chairs to make the recording space more accessible. So please donate today, cjru.ca, and everybody who donates gets a thank you gift. Any amount gets you a thank you bottle opener keychain combination. $50 gets you a thank you t-shirt. And uh, if you go on cjru.ca, you'll also be able to pledge to your favorite show and make a dedication mes message. So if it's someone's birthday that you forgot, this is a very nice way to wish them a happy birthday on 1280 AM. Um, just go in and make a donation at cjru.ca and uh, please help us reach our goal. We're so close. Um, and I have to thank some of the fine people who are helping us reach our goal. You can, if you donate, you'll be in really good company. Um, with these amazing listeners, Diane DiDonato, Ome Rahamtula, Miles Marcus, Fern Turner, who's also dedicated her donation in the memory of Randy Starkman, Mary Hines, who donated to Morning Mixtape and to All About the Funk, Emma Barrett, Estelle Starkman, Brittany Tucci, Ben Tucci, Bryce Turner, Joan Harrison, Faisal Musa, Ben Tucci, Michelle Monette, Tony Burns, uh, Mark Procopio, uh, with special thanks to The Night Shift, Alan Gates and Luca Capone, Aaron Johnson, Jake Mooney, Jeff Parker, Giovanni Villa, Rhonda Wallbank, the Young Family, and all the other fine people um, who haven't yet made it onto the list. And if, if you're not there yet, you've got a few more days to help us reach our goal. Um, and that's all in aid of helping young people who don't otherwise have a voice in mainstream media um, access programs just like this one, um, Why Are You Through the Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. So let's listen to some of the good work that they've done. Penny, what's one of the favorite clips you've lined up for us? Uh, so this first clip is from uh, the Why Are You Mental Health show, and it's a really interesting clip about living with OCD. I've been labeled with obsessive compulsive disorder. I know that in this day and age, being a perfectionist is considered to be a good thing at times. So telling someone you have OCD doesn't necessarily make you sound like an outcast. Sometimes the other person will just laugh and say, me too, thinking that my OCD isn't as serious as it is. When I say I have OCD, I mean that it controls my life. My day is broken down into sections. Each section has a written list. This is the morning list. Check phone messages, miss calls and snail mail, use massage roller for back pain, check email, Facebook, play 10 minutes of brain games, 
Review my schedule for the day, including whether I have specific messages for different people at whichever location I'm going to that day. Apply eyelash conditioner, sunscreen, two moisturizers, aloe vera and shea butter on my hands, oil on my nails, rinse my mouth, floss, clean up my breakfast items, set my alarm clock, listen to a, re a recording of me going to a music lesson, listen to a French show, wash my face for two minutes, dry my hair after I wash my face, apply lip balm, wear a headband, wear hair down, put baby powder in my slippers, brush my teeth for 12 minutes, rinse my mouth out, out six times with plain water. Check to see if I have enough toothpaste or do I need to buy it. After toothbrush, turn toothbrush on again to make sure your battery power is sufficient. Apply face cream. Put shea butter on the tips of my hair. Put aloe vera on my face. And brush this my whole routine, the time taken to do it plus the time taken to make sure that I've done it, totals about two and a half hours. If I'm putting in this amount of energy just to get ready in the morning, you can imagine the amount of energy I'm exerting throughout the day. Usually this exercise is done in a group, but to So that was just a little bit of uh, a great episode focused on mental health issues uh, common to youth and experienced by many of the team coming uh, out of the Advocate's Office for the YRU program. Um, so you can check that out at CJRU SoundCloud. Um, just go to the playlist that's labeled YRU and you'll see all of the great work of, of these um, amazing youth. And we get uh, different groups through about every season. Um, and Penny, we had another favorite clip from the past year. Mm -hmm. This clip is from their episode on Pride Week. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, mental exercise for thinking through privilege. Um, it's really nicely done. Usually this exercise is done in a group, but today we will be doing it in our minds. This exercise may trigger feelings, emotions, and thoughts that may make you uncomfortable. Even if we were in a room together, I would not stop you from leaving, but I implore you to examine those feelings and thoughts and hold on to them if you believe you are learning from them. If you are feeling defensive or angry, hold on to those feelings. Now, let's begin. I would like you to imagine that you are in the middle of a long hallway. In front of you, as the space stretches onwards, the hallway progressively becomes lighter and easier to tread. Behind you, the hallway gradually darkens and the floor beneath you becomes rougher and harder. I will now ask you a series of questions. Depending on your answer, I will ask you to move forward towards the light or backwards in the dark. If you have been the victim of physical violence based on your gender, ethnicity, age, or sexual orientation, please move backward. If you have ever been made to feel uncomfortable for your size, move backward. If you have ever felt passed over for an employment position based on your gender, ethnicity, age, or sexual orientation, move backward. If you and your primary romantic partner feel safe expressing affection in public, move forward. If you have ever considered or attempted suicide, move backward. If you have been a victim of sexual violence, move backward. If you have ever been told you are attractive for your race, move backward. If you have completed high school, move forward. If you can easily access your chosen place of worship, move forward. If you were able to complete college, move forward. If you attended school with people you felt were like yourself, move forward. If you studied the culture or history of your ancestors in elementary school, move forward. If you've traveled internationally for leisure, move forward. If your parents are still alive, move forward. If you have ever been offered a job because of your association with a member of your family or friend, move forward. If your parents have ever covered the cost of your rent, bills, or other equivalent expenses, move forward. If you've ever felt it was necessary to hide your sexual orientation or gender identity for your own safety, move backwards. If you are a citizen of Canada, move forward. If your family had good access to health care, move forward. If your preferred pronouns align with the gender you were assigned at birth, move forward. If you are a white cis male, move forward. If you have ever felt embarrassed by the clothes, food, or home your parents provided for you while growing up, move backward. If you attended private school, move forward. If you have ever felt unsafe walking alone at night, move backward. If you have ever been able to afford therapy, move forward. If you were born in Canada, move forward. If you had to reveal your sexuality or come out to your family, friends, and loved ones, move backward. If you have been divorced or impacted by divorce, move backwards. If you have ever attempted to alter the way you speak or your mannerisms, 
move backward. If you've ever been mocked for your accent or speech impediment, move backwards. If you feel good about your, how your identified culture is portrayed in the media, move forward. If you have visible or invisible disabilities, move backward. If you and your parents lived in different countries most of your life, move backward. If English is your first language, move forward. If you took out loans for your education, move backward. If you buy new clothes at least once a month, move forward. If you work in a salaried job, move forward. If there have been times in your life when you skipped a meal because there was no food in the house, move backward. If you can go anywhere easily to find cosmetics that match your skin tone, move forward. If your work holidays coincide with religious holidays that you celebrate, move forward. If you came from a supportive family environment, move forward. And finally, if you would not think twice about calling the police when in trouble, move forward. Take a deep breath. Where are you in the hallway? Are you where you thought you would end up? Do you feel any guilt or shame? Think of the people in your life. If they were in the hallway with you, where would they be? Take another deep breath. So what you were just listening to was a, a wonderful exercise in understanding privilege, um, something that, given the current news media is really useful. If you've never done this exercise, I strongly encourage you to. Um, and Cody, who produced it for the Why Are You program, um, sponsored by the Provincial Advocates Office, is with us in studio today. And we'll talk a little bit more about where privilege ends up in these discussions. And it actually comes up quite often as we explore a whole range of issues um, that the Why Are You program has identified as being really important. Everything from identity to mental health to technology and what that means for our identity. We've explored a whole lot of issues um, in the spring and summer with the launch of this amazing program. If you haven't checked it out, please go at cgru.ca on our SoundCloud. It's the Why Are You playlist, and uh, you'll hear really amazing voices of youth that you just won't be able to find in the mainstream media. Um, Coming up next, Erwin Alman, the Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, joins us in studio with Cody um, to chat a little bit about why this program is, is really exciting for us. And one of the things we did with this program over the summer was we had some younger kids who also fall within the Advocate's Office mandate come in and do a radio camp. And they had a unique opportunity to chat with, um, with Erwin Alman, the advocate, and really get that kind of kid's perspective on the work of the advocate and really what Erwin ought to be doing with his job. So let's take a little listen to some of that work from over the summer and then we'll be back um, with Erwin Elman, the Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. If you weren't the Provincial Advocator, what would you do with your life? Boy, that's tough. I don't know. I, I don't know what I would be doing. I, I'm pretty sure I would be working in an organization working with children or youth. I'm pretty sure of that. And I think I would still have that same goal of trying to find a way of being the best dad I can be and the best husband I can be. So I know that would stay the same. Do you have it's questions for question. the kids? I do, you know. Well, I have lots of thoughts. What, you, you can ask me something? Yes. What? What's your name? DJ Nick. DJ Nick. Yeah. How do you feel about youth? Do you like youth? I, I, I like youth and young people because they tend to be honest. I think they can see things that adults like me can't see. And I find myself feeling like I can have fun. What do you think about adults? I think adults are strict, but they're also right. So when, when they tell us something, I feel like they're doing the right thing and teaching us. Yeah. So it are they always right? You think they're always right, Nick? Maybe, but they have times when they're wrong. Yeah. Do you know an instance without getting yourself in trouble? Can you think of a time when an adult was wrong about something? Oh, we have hands up over here as oh, well. You do? Everyone Ready? take a turn. When they think it's you, but like you really didn't do it. Oh yeah, an adult thing. You get caught, and it's always your little sister or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they yeah, blame yeah. it on you. Yeah. That sometimes happens. What else? Mm. 
same as me. Yeah. Do you guys watch politics? Do you know who the prime minister is? Yes, um, it's what? Justin Trudeau. Yeah, what do you think of Justin Trudeau? I, I like think him. he's a nice oh. youth um, president, prime minister. I think he'll do good. Wait, there's breaking news. Because I think I've met the first person in Canada who said they don't like him. Betty, that's you. How dare you? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? What's what's the it's problem? That's a joke. Oh, oh no! You can you you can have an opinion here. Is that true? You were just joking. Yeah. You like him? Yeah. Oh. Stay oh. with me. Yeah. Everybody here is Justin okay. fan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What Justin would, Bieber. Yeah. What would his DJ name be if he was? What's our prime minister's DJ name? Come yeah. On. What? DJ. What? DJ Trudeau. No Come wait. On. DJ Justin Bieber. Like. Yeah. Yeah. No, DJ Nick. DJ Trude. DJ Trude. DJ Trude. Uh, oh. DJ Intruder. DJ Intruder. Oh, that's cool. That or sounds kind of cool. Or DJ Justin. So if he could have a DJ name, that means I could, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Give me one. DJ, what are you going to do? Irv? Elm Street. Irv. Elm Street. Irv. Ooh. DJ Irv? Yeah. That's not bad. DJ Elm Street's good. Elm Street? Anybody else? I don't like Elm Street. Because there is an Elm Street in Toronto somewhere. Isn't True. It? DJ Irving. Irving. That's kind of why did I. Player. Yeah. Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Cleveland. Irving. Uh, wasn't Doc. You, you don't even know who Dr. J is. It doesn't have yeah, a prime in your name, though. How do you know? You weren't born when Dr. J yeah, played basketball. Great. Maybe DJ U. It doesn't have to oh, rhyme with your name. DJ Irving. DJ. Irving. Like flying? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like this. Oh, 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 oh. Go ahead. DJ Change the World. I, I'm working on that one. DJ U. That's right. DJ Change the World is in the house today with us at CJRU 1280 AM. Welcome to the show again, Provincial Advocate Erwin Elman. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you in studio. And Cody, thank you also for joining us as an extra co-host today. Hey. So Hi, Cody. Cody's voice is the, the um, one you heard in the privilege exercise that we aired previously. Um, and we thought it would be just really fun considering it's CJRU funding drive and we're talking about why campus radio is so important in communities and why nonprofit volunteer radio is important. And I think if you listen carefully to the privilege exercise and played along with it, um, you'll understand that those voices and the voices of, of the people that we identified in that exercise with Cody are just really missing on CBC and CTV and 680 News. There just isn't the time there and there isn't the space. And um, as we, we heard uh, in a study here done at Ryerson, um, the voices of women and, and racialized people are really absent on the radio in particular in Canada. TV's a little bit better. But it's, it's not a great place for diversity, which is why we love the Why Are You show, because we're going to make Toronto radio landscape as diverse as this city actually truly really is when you ride the subway and, and you see um, the faces of our young people. So, Cody, we've been looking through the news. Annika will join us shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and we were in particular looking at your tweets, Erwin, <laughs> over the past year. Okay. And we thought it would be fun to talk about um, some of the biggest issues that are facing the young people in this province. So I'll turn it over to Cody. Okay, Cody, I'm ready for you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Erwin. <laughs> um, so uh, we know that you tweeted about the ratio of marginalized, racialized uh, kids in care. Why don't you talk about that quickly? Well, um, recently there was a, a study we were involved in um, that talked about the overrepresentation of uh, particularly black youth and families in the child welfare system. So especially in the GTA, far and away um, over represent. I think the stats are somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% um, of young people in care uh, are black and some of the child welfare agencies in the GTA in Toronto. And obviously that's a problem. And the study that we were involved in started to begin to talk about what that's about. What's the experience of of black youth who don't do come into care? What's the experience of black families with child welfare? How can this be prevented? And from my point of view, I probably tweeted something about this because um, you can ask me anyway. Uh, that's about racism, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, in my mind, and and uh, I think from young people's mind, there's nothing else that can explain it. It's about systemic racism that one group, uh, particularly in Toronto, are so immensely overrepresented overrepresented in the in the system that's that's what it's about to me now 
Um, we're just on the cusp. And, and I say just, I mean, and I say we, we as the province are just on the cusp of thinking about doing something about it. I'll tell you this, I, I recently heard the minister make a speech, and he's also, Minister of Children and Youth Service is also the minister in charge of the Ontario uh, Racism Directorate, which we've been here before, Ontario. There's been a, a directorate around uh, racism before in Ontario when uh, the NDP government with Bob Ray was in power, and uh, people who are old like me will remember what we called riots in, in Toronto's Young Street with um, black youth and that caused a report and caused a directorate and we're here again at a point where a report says to the province there's this real big problem with overrepresentation. We have Black Lives Matter and the Pride and all those other issues so things are bubbling up and we're looking at what happens here with police and in, in the United States so we're on the cusp of a moment to change and the the minister said, well, he said something like, we all know there's racism in Ontario. And that was his launching point to talk about what the director was going to do. And for me, I think, I'm not sure we all know that. And I, I don't think we should just be flippant about it and say, we all know. I think that's a harder piece of work we have to do. And in order to do that, I think we have to listen to the people who endure it and I think so my job is to say we have to listen to the young people who endure it and only then after we listen as a province can we say we all know there's racism in Ontario and only after we say that can we decide what we're going to do about it so for me I look for the province and the, even the premier to take some leadership on that and it's not good enough for me to say we all know it's important for the Premier to say it exists, we know it exists, we have to talk about it, we have to find a way to talk about it, and first and foremost, we as a province need to listen. And then we need together, with the communities involved, to decide on a path forward to eradicate it. That was a long answer to one. <laughs> Don't you wish I could speak in 40 characters or whatever a tweet is? <coughs> I can't. Well, you did a pretty good job on, on Twitter as the years gone by, I think. it's a Like you said, it's a really complicated issue, but on the other hand, I think people, you don't read an awful lot of, like, Black Lives Matter is by and large a lot over 18s participating. Mm -hmm. You don't read a lot of under 18s coming out with photo on the page saying, this is my story and this is my experience of racism. Do you, in the office, maybe you see and hear a whole lot more of that than the general well, listeners? I know you you might not know this, but I'm here now, and uh, in a few minutes after I finish the interview, I have to move over to a conference that we're hosting for 130 black youth in systems of care who are young people who are coming together tonight all over the weekend and then meeting with decision makers on Monday to talk about exactly that. What is it like to be a black youth being served by the mental health system, the child welfare system? What is it like to be a black youth who ends up in custody. By and large, most people in custody in Toronto uh, certainly overrepresented in terms of black youth. And how can their experience be different? How does systemic racism, I'm sure they'll talk about it, play a role in that? And how can their experience be different so that they um, leave those systems healthier than when they came in? And that's happening just now. And, and I expect uh, maybe the radio show here will want to do a story weeks from now from young people who were there and what did they say but I look forward to that I hope so it's just one good example of providing op more opportunities and more space for that so that people do hear about it and then one more follow up question for me and then I'll let Cody and Annika move on to um, the term I think systemic racism it's like important but it doesn't put a face to what it is mm -hmm. And I'm because you, you know it's enacted by people, right? So you've talked a little bit about the police and an overrepresentation in the justice system. What does that look like for kids in care? Well, the the project, the initiative that young people started that uh, began this meeting that's happening this weekend that we're hosting, they call it a hair story, and they call it a hair story because for decades, young people who are black and in care would say, "I'm in a white foster." home. I'm in a group home and I need hair product. I need to get my hair done. 
and they tell me to go to Top Cuts. <laughs> or they give me Suave or pick another shampoo that hurts or something. And it's not going to work on my hair. But then they tell me I need to use that because the other is too expensive. Young people say that's an example, a tip of the iceberg example of systemic racism. But then they go further, right? They say things like, can you imagine, you watch anybody who watched the uh, debate yesterday, an American debate, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and they say, so now I'm in a white foster, I'm only a black young person in that foster home, and maybe I used to live in Toronto, I'm in now in Beaverton, nothing against Beaverton, but it's far away from my community. And I'm sitting around the kitchen table in my foster home, and suddenly everybody starts talking about the debate and what Donald Trump said about um, the black community in the United States. How isolated do you think I would feel in that conversation? Already plucked away from my home, already living in a community that I don't know anything about, under a roof that I've just come into, and now I'm sitting in this home, this white home, that don't know me or my community or my culture or what I've been through, and that's where I'm at. Can you imagine how isolating that is? And that, they say, is an example of systemic racism because the system doesn't acknowledge that that's who I am. And they don't acknowledge it because they don't understand it and we haven't listened, and that's a form of systemic racism. And they say things like, when I, uh, they talk about, especially young people who are like, uh, Melanie Bittersing, who came, who is a child who died tragically, and people will remember her in Toronto because she's the the child who was found burned to death in a in a brute uh, a suitcase. And I, I should have said trigger warning there. I'm not joking. I should have. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't. But people remember who've been through a staggered migration experience, like they come to reunite with one parent or or a caregiver who's left their country of origin come here. And, and I remember those young people saying, so yeah, I, I made that journey and my mom or my dad wasn't prepared for me and there were no real good settlement services at the time and we know the Harris, Harper government cut settlement services. So it exists today too. And they said, so a children's aid worker got called and came to my door. And it's a white children's aid worker and anybody who knows my family who came from the Caribbean, they would say, no, my mom ain't talking her business to nobody. And she's not certainly trusting old white lady who's come to my door or worse yet, a white lady who's in her early 20s and my mom's in her 40s and that white lady's going to tell my mom how to parent. I don't think that's going to work out so well. And that's systemic racism. So they talk in many ways about things that need to be changed that only, I think, young people can say in their way. And I don't even paraphrase them well enough. I mean, it's very powerful when they say it and undeniable. And uh, for me, that's the privilege. You talked about privilege. I know you didn't mean it this way. That's the privilege I have is to hear these young people fill me up with knowledge of their lived experience and wisdom. It, uh, I, ha I, I have amazing jobs. So creating the opportunity for others to hear it too is h how I think of it. Um, and I think young people benefit from it too, but not more than the province does. And I always think about the debt the province owes to people like Cody and Annika and others in my mandate who are willing to talk, speak out. It's not easy. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you, Erwin, for uh, talking with us about that. So when we're talking about um, marginalized communities in uh, Canada, it's really difficult to not talk about... Um, Indigenous communities, mm -hmm. and um, more specifically um, about uh, all the media attention over the past, I think, what is it, year or two years about um, Aboriginal youth suicide. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is just a personal perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. Having I grew up in northern Ontario, or like the northwestern Where? region, of, uh, close to Fort, like I grew up in Fort Francis. Okay. And for me, having grown up you know, in, a in much closer proximity to Indigenous communities. Yep. Um, I remember seeing in the media a lot of people talking about, like, an uptick or an upswing in the amount of, uh, or even, like, the trouble that um, Indigenous communities and especially Indigenous youth have been um, suffering. But for me, having, like, grew up around there, it just seems more like people are paying attention as opposed to there being an upswing. Um, what do you think about that? 
Do you mean more people are paying attention to the issue, indigenous issues? Yeah, more issues? people are paying attention to the issue, as opposed to like what I've been, what I was seeing in the media over the past few years, where it seemed like they were just talking about it as if like it was a burst, like it just all of a sudden started to happen. Oh, like right. Whereas you know, like growing up, I there, understand. I know differently. It just seems like more people are like um, yes. paying attention. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think a whole bunch of things, but the young people told me in, in when I've visited. Fort Francis or further north, uh, particularly in the communities, say, north of Thunder Bay that you can only get to through by mm -hmm. plane. You know, they're, we call them in, on, in the south remote communities. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the young people said, yeah, you call us remote communities, but actually Toronto's remote to us. Mm -hmm. You're the remote community. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way of looking at it. And I think in the south, we haven't known very much. Remember Gord Downey talking about it, right? From Tragically Up saying, uh, in a, some ways, saying he didn't know. And when he found out, he decided to do something about it. And I think in the South, we didn't hear. Media didn't pay much attention. Is that systemic racism, going back to that? Probably. Why is one child worth paying attention to and another not? I mean, for years, it, you're right, it's been decades. Hun well, we know, hundreds of years, and, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission painted us a, a, a damning picture of the history Canada's had with its Indigenous people. So I do think it's true more people are paying attention. What I worry about is that paying attention is not the same as listening. Paying attention is not the same as doing something. You, you, I often think, you know, in this age where we have, um, we have, we have, I was, I watched CNN. So I did watch the debate last night. I watched CNN talking heads. And it was no offense to the journalists in the room, but it's always interesting that you have three hours of journalists talking to each other about what we just witnessed. And that's news. As if that's doing something. So watching CNN, watching the debate seems like it's doing something, but it's not doing anything. It's not even really listening in some ways, and it's not challenging and dialogue. It's so I worry that now that the Gord Downey has made us be a more aware, we think we've done something, and we haven't yet. I don't even think we've had the real dialogue and listening that we need to have. And that film is called Secret Path. It is. If you're not familiar with it. So Gord Downey helped tell this amazing true story, sadly too true and too often, um, of, of, a, of a young child who was in the care of residential schooling but really not cared for. Well, he had, his name was Charlie Wenjack, and he, he's a child 50 years ago because it's the 50th anniversary of his death that he died running away from that residential school, walking along train tracks, trying to get away and go back home. And so um, Gordonian music told that story, and and I know Nishnabi Aski Nation Nan has been very uh, supportive of the tragically of Gordonian and tragically hip doing that, and the family, and it's it's an amazing thing, and it is doing something. It is doing something, but we we need to get to a point where we agree to take action and find a path forward, and that's if any criticism of our government, because our government has been saying, our federal government has been saying very nice words, and that is welcome. I often think about the young people who are struggling in the North, where, and, and, and in many First Nations communities, who have trying to find the courage to hope. Like, that takes some courage when you are part of a legacy that every time something that might have seemed like hope in terms of your relationship with the rest of Canada got dashed. And now we have a federal government saying very nice words, sunny ways. And young people are, are wanting and daring and finding the courage to hope. But we need to act soon. It's a year since this government's been elected. And I, I know in... Um, Pekanjikum, or um, recently, I'm trying to remember the community, I shouldn't name it, but in a, a community in, Ont in Ontario's north, children have died. I know 
um, what's happening in our western provinces if you read a 10 year old this week committed suicide in a community and it's a year later from this government and it's talk about sunny ways and I think for the children and youth in my mandate who are daring to hope that hope can be dashed really quickly without action and so yes if our federal government continues to listen I think that's important if we as citizens continue to reach out and listen I think that's really important but there needs to be action um, do you think that the government's doing enough uh, to help kids um, Aboriginal youth um, specifically I, I no, obviously, I think I'd say that. But it's not a, that's not a simple question, right? Because it's not our government helping Aboriginal kids. It's our government supporting First Nations communities, living up to treaty rights, supporting those First Nations communities to fairly to look after their own children, to provide a community in their own way that will support, nourish, empower their children and we're definitely not doing enough of that mm -hmm. um, we haven't reformulated our relationship with First Nations people or rebooted it or recommitted to the treaties that we've signed we have not really um, allowed First Nations communities to lead their own communities by supporting them in the way that we've agreed to as a country so we haven't done that and to me you know we can do institutional solutions to these human problems we can build another school and we darn well should but we need to work on these big issues that are at the root of our our deteriorated mm -hmm. relationship with First Nations people mm -hmm. I think and I haven't seen movement on that yet all right yeah thank you Erwin um so speaking of uh, big issues uh, I know that I know that as the provincial advocate, you must have tons and tons of goals for what you want to see. N maybe not even necessarily done during your tenure, but uh -huh. in uh, the future. Yep. Um, but if you could pick a top five things that you want to see done for youth in this province, well, what would they be? So I know what I'm pushing for. The first thing is a big picture thing. I mm -hmm. want our province. I want our premier to say three things to children and families in the province. And that's one thing, it's one of my number one. I want her to say, children of this province, we will protect you, period. Children of this province, we will protect you. I want her to say, children and youth of this province, we will provide you what you need, when you need it, in order for you to thrive, no matter who you are. And then I want her to say families of this province. And I'm saying families in the broadest sense, families, uh, biological families, adoptive families, foster families, families like those street kids who create their own families, those families. I want her to say families of this province, thank you. We've got your back. Whatever you need to do right by your children, you've got it. I want to say those three things. And then I want her to look at the system that we have in this province that is such a mess in terms of how we protect children, support families, all over the map in terms of ministries and say, how are we going to achieve those three things I just told the children and families of this province? Because it darn well won't be the way it's arrayed now. And then I want to have a discussion in this province about how we're going to get to those three things. And then I want to do it. And I don't think it's about money because I think one of the reasons we don't do that is because we worry about how much money it's going to cost. I don't think it's just about money. Of course it's going to cost money, but it's going to be about doing things differently. For instance, to get to that point, I would like them to have a, a policy in place that whatever they fund where young people might enter or children might enter, it needs to be one a safe space or we don't fund it. It needs to have children and young people feel part of their own lives when they enter that building. 
And that could include a school, but I think it should be, a, we fund hospitals. So hospitals should be safe places for children and youth, and they should feel part of their lives when they enter in it and receive service from it. Libraries, transportation systems, that would be a revolutionary thing to do. And actually would not cost much money. But boy, would it take a shift in culture and thinking. But we can do that. The other thing, and I say this facetiously, but not really, I think they should do this. Many times politicians or bureaucrats say to me, Erwin, it seems like what you want in schools or in foster homes or in anywhere um, the government's providing care for children and youth, you want us to legislate love. And we can't legislate love. They tell me that. Uh, I've heard that many times. And I they think they got me when they say that, ah, ah, you can't legislate love. And I think that's true, is what I tell them. But I think you can create the conditions through policy, through legislation, through funding. You can create the conditions in which love can flourish. Why don't you do that? And if we had a committee, not about how we're going to do a pension plan in Ontario, I mean, that's fine. But why don't we have a committee about how we're going to legislate love? Bring all the ministries together. How are we going to do that? I think that might not cost a lot of money, but we could create that revolutionary cultural change and shift in our province that would benefit not just children and youth, but all of us. Can you imagine? Places, hospitals that everyone goes into that feel safe places. If they're safe for children, they'll be safe for adults. If you feel, if children know how to feel part of the service they get in a hospital, so will adults. Can you imagine TTC systems? I know there's lots of places that have no subway, so speaking all of Ontario, any transportation system where people feel part of their own lives and feel safe, and I mean the, the touchy-feely kind of safe, not just the physically safe, of course, physically safe, where they feel welcomed and belong. How are we going to create that? That would be a change in our province that would benefit all of us. And I, I challenged the Premier, and I must have said five things now, so I challenge mm -hmm. any Premier, and we have election coming up, if this government stays, I challenge her to make an agenda. If there's a new government, make it an agenda. How are we going to achieve these goals for us, for us all? Now we have a few more minutes, and, mm -hmm. and before we leave, I, I wanted to, one of the things, two, three things actually that you've touched on, I think will really remind me of a clip we played that Annika was part of earlier, which was about um, mental health and anxiety, and um, that's a really big growing topic for mm -hmm. youth. This is a province, you talked about funding, that said, you know, autism just needs to stop at five years old because we have no more money after you're five. Um, so, I don't know, Annick, if you have any questions you wanted to ask the advocate around support for mental health or autism, or how, how do we view young people with mental health in this province when we, we make statements like, we're not funding it after year five? Mm. Is that the question? Oh, yeah, I was looking no, at Annika. Open to anyone, I guess. I, I'm curious what Annika thinks, but, um, hmm. I, I'm not sure... So there's a whole bunch of ways of answering that, but I'm not sure we value children the way we should in the province. I think that when we make a statement about there's no money for, when we don't commit to children... Ha so when I said children should have what they... and youth should have what they need when they need it, I think about those kids with autism. It's not about a funding envelope, which really was that decision was about. Got so much money, we got this big wait list, what are we going to do? It's not a, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about what do these children need? How are we going to make sure it's provided to them? Whether they're 5 or 4 or 6 or 10 or 12 or 16 or and 18 and then apparently they go to adult services which doesn't work the transition to adult services cuz some of the kids who need these services end up in in uh, seniors homes. They're in a I've seen it. They're in a a very good home that's well supported through a children's service system and then they have to leave at 18 because that's the way the system works and now they have nowhere to go. And they're ripped up away from a caring, loving, safe family. It's ridiculous. And why do we do that? Because we don't value children in the way we should and we don't value young people in the way that we should. I don't even think sometimes we see them as human beings. That we, It's 
it's not that we forget we were children. It's that we s somehow they're not from our planet. Like, we're different as adults and they're children and that's not us. And we don't understand this concept of life trajectory that we all go through stages, right? We, It's our life. They're us. And if you see the children as that, you can't discount them in that way because it's it's their people. Um, yeah. So I think that, I think the mental health service itself, I mean, it's why you probably have heard my tweets about there's a, a young person named Chaz Petrella who died in, in Coburg. And I desperately want uh, inquest to be held. And, and we were talking, I was talking today, not to tell stories out of school, but I was talking to the director of Children's Mental Health Ontario. It's a coalition of children's mental health groups. And we were saying, why is it that while there's a lot of good talk about mental health, so there, there's this lot of effort about stigma from Bell, Let's Talk campaigns to you name it. And the public is engaged, I think, because so many people are touched, whether it's them or they know somebody or it's their relative that touched by men. Why is it we're, we're in this place where a young boy at 12 in Coburg with nine different agencies involved in his life at w the point of his death and years of being inside a system with siloed, with the Ministry of Health, with the police, with the hospitals, with the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, Community Services, with the Children's Aid Society, with the school Yet, how is it that this 12-year-old boy can go to the hospital one night and the next morning, that that night, sorry, be let out of the hospital because they didn't have service for him, the next morning be found dead in his family's backyard hanging from a tree? And for me, the bigger question is, how is it that we don't even want to have a conversation about it? Because I'm telling you, I I was in Woodstock when the students in Woodstock remarkably stood up from their desks at 9 o'clock one morning and said because there were 12 suicides in the course of a, a number of months in Woodstock, yes, there's a crisis, and we want to talk about it. And they got up from their desks and marched en masse to the city center and said, held a rally against the the advice of some service providers and politicians because they didn't want to create a contagion and further the contagion in Woodstock. But the young people said, we know you're trying hard to provide a service, but it's not good enough and we need to talk. And that's in Woodstock. And I talked to you about Colbert. And then I'm going to Sarnia where there's same concerns about young people who have committed suicide. And I've been to Attawapiskat when they had their suicide crisis at with the invitation of Chief Shashish at the time. And I spent a week there. So if it's not in the public interest to have a discussion about what we're doing now that we've acknowledged there's issues around mental health with young people and children in our province, if we're not ready to have a conversation about that, when will we? Enough already. And I think an inquest in this situation will focus the province, harness citizen participation, because that's what an inquest does, right? It's got a jury of citizens that says, we know you've tried government, we know you've tried service providers, but now it's time for the average citizen to bring common sense to bear, to listen to what happened, in this case, to this young boy, Chaz, and to say, what can we do differently so no other children end up in this situation? I think that's a real crucial thing, citizen participation. And I think the province is well ahead of service providers and legislators on this because I think the province will embrace that discussion, meaning the average person, because they want to have it, because they know that there's a problem and what and everything is all right. It's not a matter of move along here, nothing to see, we got it covered, we're making a new policy or transformation agenda or whatever government might do, there's a need for real talk about this. And citizen participation can provide that. I know i got one minute, but I want to say something about citizen participation because I'm on your radio station and I know Annika and Cody are here. And that's why I think your station is so important because it's a, it's a, 
a real way of citizen participation. It provides students at Ryerson, but I'm a backer of college radio. It provides a unique opportunity for the average citizen, the person who, as you mentioned earlier, might be invisible to have a voice. And now, I mean, I was, uh, I must admit, I, at Carleton University um, years ago, I worked on student radio. We had to splice using a razor blade and believe it or not, scotch tape. That's how we did it, Cody. We we do that. Can you imagine in the middle of the night trying to make a radio show that way? But it was amazing. And now with live streaming and podcasts, which we didn't even have computers, the opportunity for citizen participation that college radio provides, it's astounding. And so I, I, I'm so privileged, again, that word, that um, Ryerson's allowed us to help young people in our mandate to be on the air. But uh, I'm privileged to be here, too, and be part of College Radio. And I'll, I'll stand beside you when you need me. Well, we've had a wonderful time working with the Advocates Office and, and Cody and Annika. And on, we're getting a whole new group next week. So I heard. We're hoping that that kind of dialogue, just like you described, continues. But we do need a little extra help for it. It's our first funding drive. So if folks listening can go to cgru.ca and click Donate. Um, you can enter a special message to someone you love, like a birthday message, or hey, how about if it's for the YRU show that you're pledging to tonight, that you make that a special message for the children in the province of Ontario. We would love to air that or dedicate a song on your behalf. And every single donation, no matter how small, gets a thank you combination keychain bottle opener, and a $50 <laughs> de- um, donation gets you a t-shirt. So. Lastly, before we just leave off here, Erwin, do you have any questions for our young people, for Annika and Cody, who have been basically manning the mics for the last eight to nine weeks? Something like that. Yeah, it feels like that time has gone fast. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm sure of that. But what do you what do you think? Well, I'm curious about what, what you thought of this experience and being on the air. Has it taught you anything that you didn't know? Not skills, necessarily. And, you know, you asked me, what's the What's the issue that's burning for you for young people and children in the province? And I want you go first. Sure. Um, just just on that note of issue that young people have in the province, you know, um, y- Erwin, you were talking um, about how, you know, why is it that there's so much, like there's such a need for awareness of these crucial issues, but they're not being addressed and the action is not being properly taken and you know it makes you wonder when kids are spending hours and hours on uh different uh websites and 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 getting in all this information uh, about pop culture um you know where are values as a society where we're spending more time um you know you know wondering what kim kardashian is doing than than um than about the the children and and youth in the city um and um and those who are being marginalized and Aboriginal youth. So um, that's my big, biggest concern that, um, you know, I think that uh, values as a society start from um, children. And um, if they're growing up being surrounded by this uh, information, th- that's not really serving them. If anything, it's har- harming them. Uh, you know, what kind of adults are they going to grow up to be? So that's my biggest concern. Um, but on a more optimistic note, um, I, I loved being a part and I still love being a part of, of the YRU project. And, um, I think it's great, um, to be able to talk to interesting people on a weekly basis and, um, learn more about, you know, my, my world. So it's, yeah, hugely inspirational. (coughs) Sorry about that. Um, well, for me, well, I'm about to make a big, um, big uh, admission on the on the radio um so what i what i think is a big is my biggest issue is probably i have a desire for power i mean not necessarily <laughs> not necessarily just for me but for the people that i know and for the communities yeah. that i'm involved in yeah. because i have to say for the past almost six six months or so mm. i have probably been in one of the deepest depressions that i have ever experienced mm. I feel utterly powerless a lot of the time. I feel as though I, I feel as though almost as though that I've lost my voice to speak about the things that um, are going on in the world around me and that are affecting me and that are the reasons why I'm in the sort of depression that I'm in now. And I find it so debilitating 
and when I say I want power, I I want the um, systems around me to help me in that, to help me feel like I have agency over my life and agency yeah. over the world around me. Yeah. Because I just feel like I don't right now, and that's kind of an it's a little bit of a new experience for me. I at 23 years old is somehow when I feel the least powerful in my life. And um, that's. But yeah, but I, but I, do, I have also said um, through this, uh, through being on Why Are You, that it, it that it does give me um, a sense of power and a sense of agency, and I do appreciate that so much. And I and I really and I I would love to never be able to let it go, but the way the the way this um, the world around me has been affecting me lately, I feel like I haven't even been able to wield it in the ways that I wished I. I had in the past little while, and hopefully I can change that in the future. That is really profound and hard to hear, right? For us who know you, I'm sure it's hard to hear for listeners. Um, I, I, I don't even know what to say to you, but except that I believe you know this, you're not alone in that feeling, right? That I'm sure that pe- young people you've talked to understand that that's why when I said they say we want to be part of our own lives it's kind of like that feeling is stripped away from any sense of agency which for some people is really feels dehumanizing and then what and that leads to that feeling you have well I'll tell you this Cody you're not alone in this room and uh, you're not alone when you leave the air we're with you you know, that doesn't help much. and doesn't give you agency and power. Uh, but we're with you and walking beside you um, as long as you want us to. Well, radio hugs, which you can't see, <laughs> but they go through the air just like the just like 1280 AM goes all the way up into space. And our, our hugs always travel with you as well. But I think that really speaks to the difficult transition. And that's what this group has been really neat about. We had the little kids and we heard a bit from them mm. earlier in the show. Um, and they have a unique take on on things too, but it's really this weird transition time that I think a lot of people forget about um, that magic number eighteen and how it's not really so magic. It's a number, and we're all, in my mind we're we're all human, constantly making transitions every day. You don't stop at eighteen or twenty one or twenty four or twenty five. It's a process. Life is a it's a movement. It's like I'm not spiritual really, but it's a there's a trajectory. It doesn't like stop and end and now there's a new point. We're always all transitioning. And uh, we need to remember that. And we all need to feel that power that Cody was talking about. Adults who don't have that in their lives feel as debilitated too. It's a human issue. It, and unfortunately, young people and particularly some young people feel it more heavily or le- more likely to not feel that sense of agency. And that's a problem. That's, that's a huge problem. And as long as you can host Why Are You with us and maybe mentor some of the other groups yeah, that we'll that be happens. bringing. Yeah. If you can mentor some of the other groups that come through, hopefully that's a sort of a feeling of passing the power baton along a little bit. And as much listening as we can do at 12.80 a.m., I think that's the real function of campus community radio. It's volunteer-driven um, because sometimes what people do out of their hearts when they're not paid to do it is really some of the best stuff that we can do for kids and youth in the province, too. So um, hoping to hear more from um, Annika and Cody as we bring in a new group and, and as you guys mentor the little ones out and, and to their transformation as radio hosts. Um, and Erwin Elman, we want to thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. It's uh, DJ Change the World. DJ Change the World can also be found on Twitter um, at 
um, provincial advocate. No, at Ontario Advocate. Ontario Advocate. Yeah. I get it wrong every time at Ontario <laughs> Advocate. And that's where you can catch up on some of the really important issues for youth in the province that we've been talking about, like um, Aboriginal suicide, kids in care, mental health for kids, all of these kind of issues um, that we like to talk about on YRU. And you can find that on the CJRU playlist on SoundCloud. Just go to the playlist for YRU. And uh, if you want to encourage young people like Cody and Annika and, and uh, myself um, to talk a little bit more and have a little more power and have that agency and voice in community radio, please consider making a small donation today at cgru.ca. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned. Um, this is cgru.ca's funding drive. It's our first funding drive. We have a modest goal of $1,280, and we are over the $1,000 mark as of today. Woo! <laughs> So thank you guys all for helping telling your friends all about the station. And I just need to thank a couple of other names besides Cody and Annika and Irwin that are with me in the studio. Our super listener stars for donating are Deanne Di Donato, Ome Rahamtula, Miles Marcus, Fern Turner, who dedicated her donation in the memory of Randy Starkman, mm. Mary Hines, um, who's dedicating hers to the All About the Funk show, Emma Barrett, Estelle Starkman, Brittany Tucci, Ben Tucci, Bryce Turner, Joan Harrison, Faisal Musa, uh, Michelle Monet. Tony Burns, and Mark Procopio, um, and also added to the list today, Alan Gates, Aaron Johnson, Jake Mooney, uh, who donated his to the Pivot Cast project, Jeff Parker, Giovanni Villa, Rhonda Wallbank for Perfectly Queer, Queer, and also the Young Family. So you're in good company if you donate to CJRU and be part of the Campus Radio family. Stay tuned. Uh, coming up next, we got some great local Canadian music for you. Uh, and you're listening to us uh, around the world on cjru.ca or hopefully right here in downtown Toronto around Young and Dundas or anywhere south of Bloor on 1280 AM. <laughs>